Well, Merry Christmas, a few days late. But the Merry Christmas message is this, God has come to us. I saw some research by Lifeway that said 63% of Americans think that Christmas should include a visit to church. If you're one of them and you've actually come out and joined us today, we're glad you're here. The average U.S. church attendance nearly triples on Christmas Eve. Now, that survey was from 2018 and pre-COVID. Who knows what happened on Christmas Eve in churches around the country this year? You see, most people view Christmas as a religious holiday. So they feel like they ought to go to church that day, if no other day. But it's also an indicator of how their perspective is and how they live their life. It's kind of like this. They view life like a mountain. And at the top of the mountain is God himself. And then it's up to us to do the best we can with the life that we've been given to make our way up the mountain to God. That's why for many people, going to church feels like climbing up the side of a cliff. But yet they're willing to do it for a while because it's just the right thing to do. But the problem is that equates going to church like eating your vegetables or like eating a salad. You'd rather do something else, but it's the right thing to do. So every now and then you take a no thank you helping and put it on your plate. That's how most people also view their relationship with God. I'd rather do something else, but sometimes you got to do the things that you don't really want to do. So they come to church. God isn't some dog that you throw a ham bone after Christmas or Easter dinner as a special treat. It kind of makes us sound like Cousin Eddie in Christmas vacation when he and Clark are shopping together. And when Clark tells him he'd like to pay for uh, their kids to pick out some presents for each other, Cousin Eddie looks at him and says, pick yourself out something real nice, Clark. Well, why would we treat God that way? The message of Christmas is to be celebrated like this. God has come to us. In John chapter 1, verse 18, the contemporary English version phrases it this way. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is truly God and is closest to the Father. He has shown us what God is like. No one has ever seen God. In the language of the New Testament, there were three different ways to describe seeing something. The first way is described like this. It's the ability to just see something that's right in front of your face. The Greek word was blepo, and it described that ability. A second Greek word, though, was theomai. It's the word that eventually become theater, became theater in English. And it meant to watch something intently so that you could understand it. The third Greek word, though, orao, implies an interaction that's based on a relationship. And that's what's used in John 1.18 when he says no one has ever seen God. It describes the past, present, and future reality. No one has ever seen God in the past. Nobody today is finding God and nobody ever will find him on their own. Nobody's climbing that mountain to make it to the top. No matter what we do, no matter what we try, we're never going to be able to create a connection with God, a relationship with God based on ourselves. And the message of John's gospel is that trying to get closer to God on your own is a waste of time. Religion won't help you see God because religion is just just our idea as men of a system of rituals. Well, if we do these things and do them often enough or just the right way, maybe that will make God happy. Or if, if we do these ceremonies or if we do this service, it will appeal and appease God. Pick yourself out something nice, God. Sometimes people 
approach it from the sense of karma. If we do good, then we'll get good. But karma won't help you see God either. It's kind of best recognized by those scales of justice, you know, where you hope you do more good than bad, and that in the end it'll tilt in your favor. Morality won't help you to see God either. Morality is a little bit different. It's still based on what you do, but the only thing is morality is more focused on the negative of trying not to do too many things wrong to make God mad at you. John writes to tell us this, though. Nobody at any time has come to know God like that. Jesus would agree, according to Matthew 5, verse 8, when he would say it this way, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the same word, orao, is there as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Milton L Lloyd Jones phrases it this way, the being pure in heart means to be like the Lord Jesus Christ himself, perfect, spotless, and pure. Jesus claimed the only perfect and spotless people who are pure in heart, those are the people that would see God. He didn't care what you had done, or what you had never done. The only way that you're going to see God is to get your heart right so that your heart is perfect, sinless, and pure. God tells us in Romans 3, verse 10, how many will attain that kind of standing before Him on their own. There are several different translations. Let me read the, the different ones to you. The contemporary English version says, The scriptures tell us that no one is acceptable to God. The easy to read version says, There's no one doing what is right, not even one. The new century version says, There's no one who always does what is the right thing to do, not even one. And the new life version says, There's not one person who's right with God. No. Not even one. Why is it that no one is acceptable to God? Is he just that picky? Is he just that angry? Well, in verse 11 of Romans 3, it says no one understands. No one searches for God. That's why God knew that he had to do something. He had to take the initiative. And then in verse 12 of Romans 3, it says everyone has turned away from God. They've all become worthless useless. No one is kind or does any good anymore. This is the Christmas story, that even though none of us can find our way to God on our own or earn our way back into God's favor, I realize that's not exactly that encouraging Christmas message, but it's true nonetheless. The first message of the Christmas story is just that. You and I can't do anything to get back to God. But the second message of the Christmas story is this. Because of that, God came to be with us. In John 1 verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is truly God and is closest to the Father has shown us what God is like. God stepped out of eternity and into our world. He became a man just like God us. No one has ever seen God, God the Father who's pure in spirit. The only Son the, who is the true God, the one and only, the Son who himself is God, the only begotten, who's very close to the Father, by his side, close to the heart, in the bosom of the Father, who's fully embraced by the Father. He has shown us what God is like. He's made Him known. He's revealed Him. He fully explains Him. As it says in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only God. Jesus is that God. He's not a God. He is the only unique God one-of-a-kind God. 
No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. It was a phrase that expressed great closeness and intimacy. It was embracing someone close to your heart. Fully opening your arms, fully extending. I know something we haven't been able to do in forever in 2020. But it's the idea of opening your arms, wrapping them around someone, and holding them tight. And don't miss the significance that a very small word describes. Who is at the Father's side. He's, he is there. It's a perpetual present tense. It indicates that that's where he is right now and will always continue to be just that close to the Father. Martin Luther even described its meaning this way. He will forever and ever and ever and ever remain by the Father's side. It didn't say he was God, and it didn't say he will one day be God. The text says that Jesus has always been and always will be God. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is truly God and is closest to the Father. He has shown us what God is like. He's fully explained Him. He's interpreted Him. He's revealed Him. He's brought Him out into the open to be seen. He has made Him known. It carries the idea of an unveiling, an uncovering of what had previously been unseen. And it's describing as an event that's happened in the past, like Christmas past. Every Christmas is a reminder of that moment in time when God came to us. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, that moment is described this way, in anticipation, the virgin will become pregnant. And give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Do you realize how crazy that is? That God came to be with us? For 33 years, God lived with us. For 33 years, he walked with us. For 33 years, he was among us us. He was the man that they knew. They married his sisters. They were married to his brothers. Jesus had in-laws. You want to know exactly what God thinks? You want to know exactly what God expects? The immortal, the invisible, the eternal God came into our three-dimensional world as the man they called Jesus. J.C. Ryle phrased it this way, In Christ's words and deeds, in His life and death, we learn as much concerning God the Father as our feeble minds can at present bear. His perfect wisdom, His almighty power, His unspeakable love for sinners, His incomparable holiness, His hatred of sin, could never be represented to our eyes more clearly than what we see in Jesus' life and death. He came down to us when it was impossible for us to go to Him. Jesus lived that perfect, spotless, pure life that we're incapable of living. And then... Even more amazing, he offered himself up as though he were some sacrificial lamb for our sin. But because he lived a pure and sinless life, death had no power to hold him. And after three days, God said, that's enough. And he restored him back to life at his side, fully embraced where he belongs. His resurrection serves as witness and testimony that God accepted his sacrifice. Now, that's not just good news for him that he brought him back to life. but It's good news for us because sin's demands were paid in full. My sin's demands were paid in full. Your sin's demands were paid in full. The greatest gift exchange ever to occur happened when he exchanged his perfect life for my guilty life. 
And now, because that ransom price has been paid with the innocent blood of Jesus, all who are clothed with Christ are looked upon by God as if we also were perfect just like Him when we're clothed with Christ. That's what God sees when He looks at us. The best Christmas message ever is this. Christmas is God's invitation to get to know Him. John 17 verse 3 says, This is eternal life, that people can know you, the only true God, and that they can know Jesus Christ, the one that you sent. Eternal life. That's the result of knowing God, and that happens because of knowing Jesus Christ. Now, I know that we're not always that confident of our standing with God. But John would later write in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and following, This is my testimony. This is my witness. God has given us eternal life, and this life is found in His Son. Whoever has the Son has this life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have this life. And then the keeper. I've written these things to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Christmas is not God's invitation to get to know about Jesus. Christmas is God's invitation for us to get to know Jesus. It's not God inviting us to get our act together and do better in life or to get our act together and knock off the things that we're doing wrong. Christmas is God's invitation to get to know Him. When your life isn't working out like you thought it would, or thought it should, Christmas is God's invitation to you. This is who I am. Get to know me by getting to know Jesus. He knows what you long to know. Am I really okay are we good even if and even in spite of? He knows the peace that you'd find if you just get to know Him. And not just what others know about Him. And not just others who do know Him. Then you would know that you have eternal life. No doubts, no fears, no reservations. You know that you'll stand with God because... It's about what He's done, not what you've done. When you know Jesus, you know you can count on God. And that God said that His life can be found in His Son. That's why Paul would write in Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, So it's in Christ Jesus that you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You know, the ironic thing is, this passage wasn't written to convince people that they ought to be baptized. It's written to people who were believers, who had placed their faith in God and Jesus, and had expressed that faith by already having been baptized. But they write this, because they were wondering if that was good enough. They were comparing themselves to others and questioning, I'm not like them. Am I still okay? Am I good enough? It's not about who you are. It's about being one in Christ. And Christmas is God's invitation for you to become one with Him, to know Him, to love Him, to embrace Him as He embraced Jesus. Merry Christmas.